In this section, I'll be discussing fermentation. Now, fermentation is a natural process by which we can make ethanol from readily viable things such as fruits and vegetables. Now, fruits, grains and tubers have been fermented to alcoholic beverages for thousands of years. For example, they've actually found evidence that ancient Egyptians used to brew their own beer. So yeast is used to break down complex carbohydrates into simple sugars. So long molecules of carbohydrates can be broken down into smaller sugars and then used to ferment into ethanol. Now, carbohydrates, usually in the form of glucose, sucrose, or starch, are used, and they are the starting raw material for making the ethanol. Now, looking at a couple of examples of alcoholic beverages, beer, for example, as you can see here, it's usually produced from barley, which is grown in fields. It's treated so that the starch is broken down to fermentable sugars. Another example is wine and grape juice is the source of the sugars for the fermentation. So I'm sure you've all seen vineyards before where they're making wine. So it's the grapes grown in the vineyards that they make the wine from. And different grapes will create different types of wine. As you can see here, you've got red and white. So they're different types of the grape. Now what we need for fermentation is microorganisms called yeasts. Now these are quite large microorganisms. They're different to bacteria. And they produce enzymes that actually catalyze the conversion of glucose to ethanol and also carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So when we ferment things, there will always be carbon dioxide gas coming off. So let's look at the raw material for fermentation. In Australia, for example, we grow a lot of sugarcane, mainly up in North Queensland. And it's a great crop. It grows really well in the heat and the hot conditions and humid conditions and we get a lot of sugar from sugar cane. But we also get something called molasses, which is a sugary brown syrup, which can also be used to be made into food products, but it contains a high sucrose content. So it's actually perfect for Australia to use this to produce ethanol and alcoholic beverages. And if you've ever heard of Bundaberg rum from Bundaberg in North Queensland, it makes sense. There's a lot of sugar cane up there. So that's where Bundy rum comes from is from North Queensland sugarcane. Now let's look at sucrose. It's a simple sugar and it is actually a combination of two different sugars stuck together. Now sugars are generally in a ring structure as you can see here. Either a six membered ring as you can see here or not a very good drawing but a five, a five membered ring. So glucose and fructose are both ring structures of carbon. And as you see in the picture, the red is the oxygen and the blue is the carbon. So we can take sucrose and ferment it into ethanol. And th with the sugar cane, because we've got so much of it, it's an e economically viable way to make ethanol by fermentation. Now let's look at the equation for this reaction. And you will have to remember this. Now on the left there, we have a molecule of glucose, which is C6H12O6. It's a long carbon chain molecule. And if we put in a yeast enzyme, what we get is two ethanol molecules. So that's the formula for ethanol. And we get two carbon dioxide molecules, gaseous. So just to double check, it's a biochemical process. Glucose goes to carbon dioxide and ethanol and you need yeast for this reaction to go forward, okay? And fermentation takes place in anaerobic conditions. Now this word just means without oxygen, okay? And we use this word also in microbiology when we're describing bacteria, either aerobic bacteria, which grow in oxygen, or anaerobic bacteria, which grow without oxygen. So we exclude oxygen from the reaction system when we're doing fermentation. And this is for a few reasons. To avoid aerobic respiration and unwanted reactions. So if we had lots of different reactions going on at the same time during fermentation, you could see that we would get less of the product that we want. And of course, if we're after ethanol, then we want as much as we can. We don't want all sorts of side products. So these are a few of the reaction conditions we have to consider.
when, when we're undergoing fermentation. So looking at the process, it's the enzymes that yeast produce which breaks down the sugars. So it's the action of a living organism which is actually getting this reaction to move forward. Now enzymes are actually protein molecules and they act as biological catalysts. So in previous lessons we've discussed catalysts such as metal catalysts, but we can also have biological catalysts such as here in fermentation. So enzymes are simply just a type of protein that the body produces. So what do we need for fermentation? There's a few conditions that we need. We need the presence of yeast. Now this is a picture here of a type of yeast or a lot of yeast cells. We need a specific reaction temperature and that's 37 degrees Celsius because this is optimum for enzyme performance. And there's a few other reasons it has to be 37 which I'll get to shortly. Now the solid raw materials such as your sugar cane, your fruit or your vegetable, your grain such as your barley, they have to be chopped up and minced up to increase the surface area for fermentation. So if you think you just threw a whole potato in, you'd only have a very small surface area. But if you chopped it up really finely, you'd have a lot more surface area for the fermentation. So the reaction will actually go faster. And you need the absence of air. Now, this is a little diagram to help you remember what fermentation is all about. So we start with glucose, we come along with an enzyme from the yeast, and we come over and produce ethanol, carbon dioxide, and heat. And that will always be the same reaction for fermentation. Very basic one, but it'll help you to remember. Now fermentation is an exothermic reaction. And what this means is that heat energy is released. So not only does this reaction produce bubbles and gas, but it also produces heat. So when they're doing these fermentation reactions on a large scale, you have to be very careful. And some of you may have heard stories of neighbours or uncles who've tried to ferment beer in their, um, in their garages and it's exploded or <laughs> because they're not letting out, they're not releasing the gas. So you must ensure that the heat does not build up and increase above 37 degrees. And too high a temperature will deactivate the enzyme. So that's why we need a specific temperature because above this, the yeast will die and the reaction will stop. And also below this, the reaction will either go very slowly or not at all. So it's the optimum temperature for fermentation. So fermentation reactions, what they use is alcohol tolerant yeast. Because if you imagine using a yeast that wasn't tolerant to alcohol, once the alcohol starts being produced, it will die and the reaction will stop. So in fermentation, the concentration of ethanol can increase to about 15% before the yeast will start dying. So anything above that, the yeast will start dying. So let's look at a couple of examples of how much ethanol is in a couple of uh, very popular alcoholic beverages. In wine, it's about 12 to 15%. And beer generally has a smaller percentage, about 5%, with less in light beers. So they can change the ethanol content depending on who's brewing the beer and what beer they're brewing and the sort of hops and barley that they're using. Fortified wines like port and sherry have a higher ethanol concentration again, around 18%, and they get this higher concentration by adding extra ethanol. Spirits on the other hand, such as whiskey and brandy, things such as gin and vodka, all those top shelf spirits that you see, they contain about 40% ethanol, but they, they vary. And the higher concentrations of ethanol in spirits is actually from distillation. So it's not from adding extra ethanol, like with the fortified wines, it's from a different process called distillation. And this is how we get a higher content of ethanol. So looking at the purification of ethanol products. Distillation actually removes the water content from the fermented juices. So by removing the water, you can think that you'll have a higher concentration of ethanol as you, as you keep removing that water. So you can get 35 to 50% ethanol mixture produced by doing distillation. And by 
by doing even more fractional distillation, you can get up to about 96% ethanol produced in an alcohol distillery, which you can see here in this picture. So the separation of water is done by fractional distillation, as I mentioned. But it's difficult to produce a higher purity because of the strong hydrogen bonding between the water and the ethanol molecules. And if you remember back to our last lesson, when we discussed alcohols, okay, if that's an R group, which is an alkyl group, and we have our OH group of the alcohol, and then if I draw the water molecule here, okay, oxygen, what we're going to have is hydrogen bonding between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and hydrogen bonds are very, very strong. So that's why we can't, we can take out as much water as we can, but we can only get up to about 96% because we can't take it all away because this bonding is just too strong. So now let's look at the purification and the actual procedure. So there's seven steps to this. This is quite simplified, but it'll give you an idea what they actually do in distilleries and also in laboratories. So firstly, the organic biomass is crushed and grinded. And then we use dilute acid, either hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. And it's added to hydrolyze the biomass into, so that, sorry, we can obtain sugar. Now the word hydrolyze just means ripping apart of hydrogen bonds. Okay, so we're ripping it apart so that we can obtain the sugar. We then filter it to remove all the solid bits that we've just broken up. And then again we treat it with, we, we treat the acidic solution containing the sugars, the filtrate is treated with calcium hydroxide to neutralize the acid because calcium hydroxide is a base. So we want to neutralize that acid. Part five, again, we do the same thing, filter to remove any solid residue. So by, by reacting an acid with a base, we're going to get a precipitate. So then we have to filter and remove that precipitate. Number six, we introduce yeast or bacteria to the sugar solution to start the fermentation uh, process. And finally, we get ethanol produced and this mixture is distilled to get pure ethanol. Now let's look at the importance of the fermentation process. Currently ethanol produced from fermentation is used in all alcoholic beverages. So that's a very big use. There is a very big market all around the world for alcoholic beverages. And some is also used in industrial alcohol applications, such as for a solvent, for use as a solvent, which we've discussed. Now, remembering back again, ethanol can be dehydrated to form ethylene, which is the important raw material for petrochemicals. So if you remember our reaction where we have Okay. Okay, so if we have ethanol here, okay, where these these are hydrogens, these are all hydrogens. And if we dehydrate, which means to take off a water molecule, what we're left with is ethene or ethylene, which is an alkene, very important alkene in the petrochemical industry. So, with petroleum resources depleting, fermentation is a potential alternative source for ethylene and also for fuel for transport. So, that wraps up the discussion today about fermentation. If you just remember that if you take a sugar and you react it with yeast or a yeast enzyme, you'll get ethanol and carbon dioxide gas and also heat will be produced. So, we'll, we'll move on to some questions now. Question one, which alternative identifies two methods used in the manufacture of ethanol? So our answer there is going to be part A, the fermentation of sugars, which I've just discussed. So we know that that produces ethanol and also the addition of water to ethene. So this is the opposite of this reaction I just discussed here. So if we take ethene and we add water, what happens is that double bond will break and we will get ethanol. Okay, so there's two ways 
to produce ethanol. And if we look at the other alternatives for this question, you can see that none of those are correct. So part A is our answer. Question two, which of the following is incorrect about the conditions of fermentation of sugars? So oxygen must be excluded to prevent aerobic respiration taking place during fermentation. So our answer there is the presence of oxygen is incorrect, which means, just to recap, that the others are all correct. We do need a warm temperature of 37 degrees, we need appropriate moisture, and we do need a yeast enzyme for fermentation. Question three, write an equation to represent the fermentation process. So if we remember, we're going from glucose to ethanol and carbon dioxide, we need to remember our structures. So we need to remember C6H12O6 is glucose, we need a yeast enzyme in the equation, and we get two ethanol molecules aqueous and two carbon dioxide molecules gaseous. So this equation is quite important for you to remember. Question four, describe conditions under which fermentation of glucose is promoted. So thinking back to the conditions of this reaction, we need an enzyme or yeast, we need to maintain the temperature at 37 degrees. We need raw plant materials chopped up and mashed up to increase the surface area for fermentation so that it goes faster. And we need to exclude oxygen from the process, so it needs to be anaerobic. And finally, question five, what are some issues in fermentation that require monitoring and controlling? Well, first of all, temperature is very important. Fermentation is an exothermic reaction, which means it gives off heat. So heat is re released as the reaction goes on. And we have to ensure that the temperature does not increase too much as it may deactivate the enzyme produced by yeast. Ethanol concentration is also very important. It can increase to about 15% before the yeast starts to die. We need to use alcohol tolerant yeast strains, otherwise they would die straight away once ethanol starts to be formed in the reaction. And the alcohol must be removed as it is produced to prevent the alcohol concentration reaching above 15% where it will start killing off the yeast, even the alcohol tolerant yeast. And finally, oxygen is also very important in this reaction. The presence of oxygen can promote unwanted reactions of glucose in place of fermentation reactions. And also it's toxic to anaerobic microorganisms which help the process along. So oxygen is excluded from fermentation vessels in industry. And also the solution is actually boiled before the addition of the enzyme or yeast, and that's to actually help reduce the dissolved oxygen content. So that's another way to help get rid of the oxygen. So that's the discussion on this section for ferment fermentation. And in the next section, I'll be looking at a laboratory experiment that you can do in school to show fermentation.